things aren't true because the majority of the field has always thought something is true. So many cases in science like that, big and small, you can look into it. The theory of plate tectonics, right? There was one researcher thinking that earthquakes were made by plates. The whole field rejected it for a long time and until suddenly they didn't. And now it's generally accepted. So many ideas like that. I'm not saying that 2D polymerization is a discovery of that order, but it is, it is a nugget of a discovery and it starts with, hey, it's possible to make the material. Hey everyone, welcome to It's a Material World, where the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. Consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. It would really help us out. And also we have a free MSE company database categorized by industry sector, location, as well as internship and full-time titles. So if you're interested in that, you can find the link in the description below. And now let's get onto the episode. Hey everyone. Today's special guest was recently featured in the news for his lab's development of a material that is stronger than steel, yet as light as plastic. They did so by achieving a feat that many thought was impossible, polymerizing a material in two dimensions. We're excited to welcome Dr. Michael Strano onto the show, a chemical engineering professor at MIT and senior author of this new study that may be a game changer in a variety of applications that require a great strength to weight ratio. I'm looking forward to see how this all came to be. So thank you for joining us today, Michael. Thank you, Penny. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. So yeah, getting into it, you and your work, lab's work were featured in Nature, USA Today, MIT News, with a claim that you have the materials yield strength that is twice that of steel and only one sits the density. We would just love for you to dive into it and explain exactly what this material is and what gives it the unique combination of all the properties. This was an interesting discovery. Your listeners probably know what a plastic is. Plastics are made of molecules uh, called polymers and polymers are molecules hooked together in a one-dimensional chain. So they're noodle-like molecules. If you look at your plastic case on your laptop or just plastic all around you, it's basically pressed noodle molecules. Scientists have wondered if you could, instead of making a snake-like molecule, could you polymerize as a sheet in solution. And there are big advantages to doing that. There's computational work. People have used computers to simulate these dream materials. And it turns out they're, they would be very strong, particularly for impact resistance. If you try, if you press on flat plane and you can align these molecules in the plane. Polymerization in two dimensions has a lot of problems. We can go into that, but it was thought to be almost impossible in, in the literature, other scientists have called it a dream. We didn't call it that. They, they say it's a dream of solution polymerization. So we started looking into this about three years ago, three or four year, years ago. And we started looking into the theory and why polymerization can't happen in as a sheet. We call it 2D because the molecules are hooking as a sheet. There's really only two dimensions to their hooking together. There's, they still exist in, in three dimensions. And we found the reasons why this doesn't work. And then we started thinking about how to get around it. And long story short, we invented this new material, which we call 2DPA1. It's a polyaramid. That's the chemistry is called an aramid. If your listeners can look that up. Actually, the material we discovered chemically looks a lot like Kevlar. Your listeners will probably know what Kevlar is. It's a very strong polymer. It sticks to itself and it forms very strong fibers. So Kevlar is this one-dimensional snake-like mo molecule. It, it sticks to itself and it makes it exceptionally strong. We use these fibers, we make, we make bulletproof vests on it, protective equipment, mountain climbing equipment. It's one of the strongest polymers that you could put. It was, was discovered at DuPont. And the chemistry, it's, it's a aramid, a polyaramid. You can look up the uh, structure there. We made a two-dimensional version of this polyaramid, a, a cousin of Kevlar, if, if you will. It has amazing properties. It shares the property of Kevlar that it likes to stick to itself. So I want you to imagine little platelet molecules. But the cool thing is they, they love to stick to each other like Kevlar. And it turns out that sticking together means if you make a film of this or a membrane or a flat plate, they... If you try to impact the plate, the, the material does a good job of distributing your impact through every single plate. That's what makes Kevlar strong. It distributes the uh, tension or the mechanical force, it distributes it all throughout the fiber. And 2DPA1 will do that, but in plane. So just to summarize, it's a, it's a really interesting story. There's two important 
things about the work, I think. One is that we did discover this very interesting material. This 2D PA1 is a this Kevlar cousin, which has fascinating properties. But then also, I think we've shown that it is possible to polymerize in two dimensions. And that means there may be a, a whole new family of polymers, maybe the same kind of polymers that are around you, but just made a lot stronger in a certain dimension. So I think there's excitement in the field on both of those fronts. Right now, we're wondering what other polymers can we make this way? No, that, that's really fascinating. I guess, so my understanding when I was reading through this article is the main challenge here is like the entropy that comes into play in this process, the, the disorder. And, you know, if um, like one molecule in that chain suddenly jumps to another plane or, or um, is kind of like out of line, then that, that suddenly makes it 3D polymerization. So what exactly about this polyaramid uh, like polymer and I guess the process as a, as a whole allows it to be formed in like a 2D disc shape. I'm impressed with you, Pinneth. You did your homework. <laughs> wow. Um, and your podcast listeners, they're getting a really good insight in, into the science. But if you're exactly right, what we found was if you imagine a growing disc and little molecules are coming in and they're, they're hooking in plane. Well, what happens is if just one of those molecules rotates out of plane, I'm using my hands. If you're listening to this in audio, if you could imagine a molecule rotating out of plane, now you're growing in 3D. And the problem is you can mathematically show that a polymer growing in three dimensions will always be faster than a polymer growing in two dimensions. And so this was a very depressing result because it means you'll never, grow, unless you do something, unless you have a trick, you'll never grow a two-dimensional polymer. It'll always be a little tiny fragment inside a big C of faster growing 3D. So you need something. What we discovered is a mechanism that we call, it's a little bit of jargon, but it's autocatalytic templating. Scientists like to use big words. Catalysis is when a molecule helps other molecules to react. So a catalyst you sort of sprinkle in and it, it makes other molecules do their chemistry, but it itself is not consumed in the chemistry. So what we think is that little seeds of a two-dimensional polymer, if they could absorb on their plane another monomer, they'll hold it in place for other monomers to hook to it, but in plane. And then that little seed can do the same thing for other monomers. So the material can catalyze itself. And we call that autocatalysis because itself like automatically catalyzing. And it turns out that one of the things you need to have happen is the monomers need to like to stick in plane. They need to like to absorb. And that's what this 2DPA1, these monomers, are, they can hydrogen bond. That's the stickiness that Kevlar has. And that's the stickiness that 2DPA1 has. It, it forms hydrogen bonds out of plane. So you could think of these molecules as having like Velcro. They just, if they get near each other, they will stick. That's enough to promote the growth in plane. So we've done a lot of mathematics and modeling to show that that's true. And it turns out you can, you can grow materials in this planar format. That stickiness not only helps the material to grow, but when you then make a film or a chunk of material, that's what gives these platelets their ability to adhere to each other and then they become mechanically strong. No, that's, that's fascinating. And, and I guess taking it that step to the, the property side. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but just the allowing it to be in a disc form and then kind of having it more like compact stacking, is that what leads to the, the high strength, but you know, low uh, relative weight? Yeah, so the material itself has a very low density. If your readers are familiar with graphene, graphene is a carbon, but molecular thin film. It's a single carbon atom thick film. It was the winner of the Nobel Prize in physics in 2009. There's been a lot of work on graphene. This material has strength comparable to graphene, but uh, you could imagine it having holes actually all throughout. You're punching molecular holes into it. So there's a lot of mass that's lost. It's a big insight from... We have collaborators at uh, Army Research Labs and they published a paper and they showed if you look at how a film actually absorbs mechanical energy, it doesn't need the spaces that are missing. That's how they have dreamed up these materials, graphene, but holes punched in them. You, you don't need that material. So you can get things that are really, really strong and all that extra mass is just thrown away. They predicted that we would achieve a new class of materials that are very light, but exceptionally strong. 
So when you said that other people called it a dream, uh, <laughs> was the main reason just that the preferential growth in the 3D or were there other factors that you also had to overcome in all your research? Well, it turns out that people have made 2D polymers. They've made some progress throughout the decades, but not in a very impressive way. So there was in 2010, and I say that objectively, like those researchers also would say, yeah, it's, it's a little bit. So for example, researchers were able to make a, a polymer on the silver, on a silver surface, not just any, but a very flat, if your readers are familiar with crystallography, the 111 surface of, of silver, you could make a little bit of polymer. You could image it with very specialized tools. And it, it shows that it can be done, but notice what the silver is doing is holding those monomers in place really precisely, and then they can grow. But what do you do with that? You have little nanometer patch, one you know, nanometer patch of polymer. That's where the field has been. It's been trying, the dream part was, was boy, could we do this in solution? Could we have little, little sheet-like molecules growing in solution? And the reason why that was a target is because then you could really make a lot of the material. So much of the material that you could make something you could hold in your hand. And that's why this discovery that we've made that behind the scenes, that's actually why this is exciting. First of all, the chemicals we used are really cheap. They're widely available. Sometimes in, in material science, you can make a neat material, but an organic chemist has to do 27 steps. Maybe they're the only ones in the world that can make it, but this is not that material. And when you produce this 2D PA1, from the very first time we made it, you could spin coat it on as a film and it makes beautiful aligned films. So these, and you can show these platelets when they come together as a film, they like to organize, they stack like Legos, you know? So it's, imagine turning over a bucket of Legos and they're already, they're already assembled. They make toys like that. They put little magnets in them or something, but, but imagine that it's very convenient from a processing standpoint. I've worked in nanotechnology for a long time. We work with carbon nanotubes, um, graphene, other little quantum dots. There's a whole area of the field that just does nothing but investigate how to get them to align and assemble. And that's really, that can take years of study. So it was very surprising and very convenient that you just spin coat this material and it, it makes these platelets, they're very well aligned. And it's because they like to stick to each other. They have these hydrogen bonds. So, you know, and that, that leads me right to my next question, which is we hear about, um, I guess the challenges that come into play when we hear about other material innovations and usually it's related to the processing whether it's the cost of the raw materials or the difficulty to really scale up in production but that's what makes this even more exciting is the ability for this material to self-assemble into sheets um so i guess i was wondering you said three years ago you you and your lab really dove into why um, it was thought to be impossible and then circumvent that. And so can you talk through the discovery of maybe this combination of this polyaramid, but also like the poly polymerization process too? And was that, did that go hand in hand with each other or was, did one come before the other? I think once we had the idea that it was possible to make these materials, we started looking. And I think one thing that I wanted to mention is that our army research collaborators, they dreamed up these materials. Actually, they said they had trouble publishing their paper on these materials. These materials generally, these are like two-dimensional polymers that they've simulated the properties of, but had not been made. And they had trouble publishing that because reviewers said, oh, that's interesting, but these materials don't exist. And they may never exist. And in fact, when they went to organic chemists and said, oh, can can you make this for, for us? And they said, no. And that's true. My <laughs> colleague at MIT, they said, um, interesting. No, can't make it. <laughs> and they're correct. There's no organic chemistry way to, to make that. And a lot of organic chemists have an intuition, like this thing can hook together in all, all kinds of, of different ways. As soon as we knew that it could be done, if, you know, we started looking for it. And it turns out the looking for it is not obvious. You can't use the same techniques that, that polymer chemists use uh, things like a chemist would use, there's a technique called chromatography, high pressure chromatography. We don't have these methods yet. A lot of our paper that came out in February is teaching people new methods. If you make these materials, how do you show that you've made them? You know, so we develop new NMR techniques, new um, atomic force microscopy techniques, different. It turns out to be very fortuitous that it makes these aligned films. If you have a chunk of material that's all aligned, you can understand what you've made better than if you have little bits of stuff. 
Um, and I've worked in nanotech technology, so I know that quite well. I've, uh, I've struggled with bits of stuff for a long time. So we had a lot of false starts. We, we, have, we, had a, we chased after lots of junk, lots of things that weren't. Um, so as we developed and refined these te techniques, but 2DPA1 uh, um, started to show these properties and, and we studied it. it I, I would say we knew we had something new long before we had all the experiments in place that could, that could actually pr prove it. We, we sent the paper off. They, reviewers were skeptical. They asked for a, for, for a lot of more things. Actually, one of the things we discovered while the paper was in review, we wanted to get a better handle on the mechanical pr properties. And one of the things you can do is called a bulge test. It's actually a pretty neat test. You take a silicon wafer that has little holes or buckets in, in it, but they're sealed. It turns out if you spin coat, can you define spin coating or explain explain what that is? Spin coating is you take your, your surface, normally a silicon wafer or just a flat surface, you spin it and uh, you pour your oh, material okay. on top of it. Got it. Yeah, it's it's very <laughs> fancy. Okay. Yeah, it's very <laughs> fancy. But, but what that what that spin coating does is it takes the liquid and because the liquid is running along the surface, it just makes a nice uniform. It's just as the material is running off the side, it makes a very uniform layer of liquid, which can become a uniform layer of your material. So that, that that's spin coating. Once you make a material like 2DPA1, you can transfer it. People that work in graphene can take this molecule layer. You can only do this with things like, like graphene. This molecule layer, you can transfer it, and it's strong enough to wear it. So 2DPA1 has that property. You can transfer it. And not a lot of other materials can you, can you do that. You make a nanometer scale film and then just put it on top of another, uh, another surface. These bulge tests are interesting. So you, you get a surface and then you have little bubbles and you can press on the bubble and you can learn about how strong your material is. The first thing you learn is it's strong enough to make a bubble because not all materials can make a bubble. But then we put those on the shelf. We put the mechanical measurements from that in, in the paper. Uh, while the paper was in review, we were surprised. We went back to those bubbles. They were still inflated. And what that means is, at, one of the only materials that can do that is graphene. Uh, graphene is molecularly impermeable. So um, gas molecules can't go through. And so even as a single atomic layer, it'll trap gas maybe indefinitely. So 2DPA1, we just noticed, had that property. These bubbles remain. We, we still have them inflated. That's unusual. Polymers around you, you put your sandwich in a plastic bag. It's supposed to keep air out. And it does, but there's still a little bit of air getting in. And that's because if you look at the polymer in your plastic bag, it's basically a plate of noodles. There's little holes between the noodles. That's where your sauce or your, your, your soy, soy sauce goes in, right? But if your noodles were hooked together as tightly bound flat plates, there'd be no holes. So, you know, you pour your sauce on it, it would not get into those cracks. So uh, that was a discovery. So it turns out 2DPA1 is a polymer that has the lowest permeability. It means it can be a good barrier material. We use polymers all the time in our daily lives to, to seal things in. We, we paint and coat and protect and polymers do a good job, but they still have those holes. So 2DPA1, I think among other things is gonna form at the basis for new coatings that, are, that seal completely. You explained a lot of your lab's work in the accomplishments, and I think that it's a great case study for students who want to push the frontiers of material research and help achieve something that was previously thought impossible. Uh, could you kind of give us insight into uh, what happened in your lab or what you think enabled this uh, growth and understanding that was impossible for the last couple of decades and what separated you from other lab groups in the same space? I think there is a huge psychological barrier if an entire field tells you something can't happen, or if something is hard, or if, or a dream. Like I think that, and sometimes those things are true and they're justified. But I think if you send a student into the lab and you say, try to make this material, oh, by the way, it's impossible. Well, I, I think because you're not gonna have somebody work with you for two years looking for an impossible thing. I think it does matter. I think there is a place for theory and prediction showing that something is possible. But then there's also a place for not deferring to an authority. It's actually, it can be pretty daunting when an entire field says this is not true. And then you're the lone researcher having to make a decision. It's, it's hard to get funding for ideas like that. So maybe that's the lesson for your new scientist too, it's, is that um, things aren't true because the majority of the field has always thought something is true. So many cases in science like that, big and small, you can look into it. The theory of plate tectonics, right? There was one researcher 
thinking that earthquakes were made by plates. The whole field rejected it for a long time and until suddenly they didn't. And now it's generally accepted. So many ideas like that. I'm not saying that 2D polymerization is a discovery of that order, but it is, it is a nugget of a discovery and it starts with, hey, it's possible to make the material. Yeah. And it seems like it boils down to also like just first principles thinking too, um, and, and focusing on, on the fundamentals and work, working your way from there. So that's really fascinating that you mentioned that. Um, and you mentioned barrier coatings as well. So now I kind of want to get into the so what of all of this, you know, why is this important? What could this lead to um, for our future? And I read that this material could be used um, for, you know, durable coating for automotive or automotive parts or cell phones or even construction material for bridges. But I wanted to hear about the potential application that excites you the most and why that's the case. Well, right now, what excites me the most um, from an intellectual standpoint is what other polymers can we make in this way? I wouldn't have that idea if we didn't have this theory that says there could be lots of other polymers. All you need is to have them stack and interact. That's my primary interest. It's a fundamental question. Could we have, uh, could the polymers all around us have cousins waiting in the wings that are this fascinating two-dimensional geometry? That's a fundamental scientific question. From a practical scientific question, we're interested in coatings because that's a great way to start. Coatings are, they're thin and they're easy for us to study, but we have a lot of partners and potential collaborators that know a lot more than we do about making all the things you listed composites for bridges or airplane wings and how to manufacture it and so forth. That's not going to be our lab. That's not our expertise. But one of the things we do study molecules moving through material. I have a part of my lab where we're interested in membranes and uh, how to separate gases and how to separate liquid. I run a Department of Energy Center on fluids confined in very small geometries. We, we call it CENT. It's the Center for enhanced nanofluidic transport. And it's 16 researchers around the US working together, theorists, experimentalists, trying to understand what happens to fluids like water when you have them in a very small volume. They start to deviate significantly from theory. So this 2DPA1, I think, is going to be a great test bed for that. It makes very new and interesting pores if we can keep the pores open. The way we make the films now, they are, they're stacked. They have this barrier property. Let me talk about applications for your, your listeners. One of the things we think we could do is coat the inside of steel pipes that prevent hydrogen from leaking through. So your listeners probably know we would like to go to a hydrogen economy, hydrogen as a fuel is perfect. It releases its energy. Its waste product is water. That, that's great. It's, like, it's the most environmentally friendly exhaust you could make. But hydrogen is tough as a fuel. It's dangerous. And one of the ways it's dangerous is if you put it in a steel pipe, hydrogen molecules are so small, they can go into the lattice of the steel. And when they do that, in short order, they embrittle it. They turn this steel, which is very strong, Locally, they turn it into glass. It's called uh, hydrogen embrittlement. As an engineer, it's a nightmare to work with. You could have miles and miles of pipe, and you never know if there's a little spot that's becoming brittle. And then what happens when hydrogen breaks out of the pipe? It explodes. That could be prevented if you have an easy way of just coating the inside of that pipe with a strong but thin thin material. And just if it's impermeable to hydrogen, then you've solved that problem. It's not a small problem at all. That's one example. We consider that low, low hanging fruit. So we're working on that. I alluded to it before. There is a way to make 2D PA1 films so that instead of being barriers, you, you can actually keep their pores open. And so I'm very interested in that as well. Can there be versions of 2D PA1 where we can uh, purify water or purify gases? Uh, just by passing them through these membranes. They would have an advantage in that they would be much, much thinner than our current membranes. So you could get a lot more gas or water through them. All, all of that led me to just wondering like um, what materials are, are currently being used in, in those applications, um, whether it's a coating application barriers um, and what advantages it, are the current materials that are being used just like not as impermeable um, in that specific application? The most impermeable polymer still will let lots of gas go through. I mean, lots of comparatively. 2DPA1 right now, the way we make it now with all the defects and everything, it's a, we estimate it's about 50 to 100 times 
more impermeable than the next than the best polymer. If you choose all the polymers, there's a polymer that's used as a barrier coating the most. So we're better than that. And we think that ultimately, you know, when we get the kinks out, it, it could basically be impermeable. We have some measurements in the lab that show that it's nearing impermeability. For the hydrogen e example, I don't think that's solved. I'm interested in these problems that, that are essentially unsolved. We need some other material to come in to solve it. Got it. And then one quick follow-up question. Um, I was just curious with the, what is the timeline looking like here um, with this, you know, you released the paper last month, how many years, months, whatever, are we away from uh, actually like translating that to an industrial application? Yeah, journalists always talk about that. It is tough. I run a, a research lab. We do basic research. Uh, we make a lot of discoveries. The process that happens after this point is pretty variable. We're not going to manufacture anything in, in my little lab at MIT, but partners, there is a lot of interest. I'll say normally the standard answer from lab discovery to product, I think the average is maybe 10, 10 years. It normally involves a startup, sometimes a failed startup or the, this and that. I will say this though, um, 2DPA1 has a lot going for it. First of all, I think industry uh, sees the benefits of it right away, and we're and we're in the in the process of helping and working with them. The material, sometimes in nanotechnology, you make a little bit of material, and it's and it's interesting. And sometimes a whole study is just on nanometer patches of material, and, and you you press on them, and you get really impressive properties. Like um, this is true for graphene and carbon nanotubes. You measure mechanical properties like diamond, but then the challenge has been how do you get that into a a macroscopic film and actually make make a chunk of material and sometimes that has to take a long time and on the path you get lackluster properties because of this or, or that so there's the scale up and there's a problem and fixing the problems of, of scale up scale up not like a bridge but scale up just in a coupon sample that you can test so with 2dpa1 we have leaped over that so i think the advantage of growing something in solution I mean, we have enough where we make grams and we can make kilograms at the laboratory scale and that means we've leapt over a lot of the pitfalls. How do you make the material? Can you make it enough? Can you make it practically? Can you make a sample big enough? And just in our paper in February, we're already at point. So that's very promising. So after that, that though, so it's 10 years on average, but there, 2DPA1 has a lot going for it that can shrink that considerably. And so I guess you've talked a lot about the benefits, a lot about how you've been able to have this unique solution to a lot of the problems you normally have. What challenges are remaining for you and your lab group to solve with uh, PA 2D1? Solving with 2D PA1 in particular, we want to look at defects that are generated and we want better ways to characterize the materials as, as, they're, as they're produced. Whenever you synthesize a material, you never make 100% pure of that material. You always make some things on the side. And we need better ways of understanding what you make on the side. And so this will be a fascinating area. As we refine 2D PPA1, we're also refining our techniques for measuring two-dimensional polymerization, understanding it. One of the things that we're interested in is growing the platelets bigger because we can actually get even better properties if the platelets grow bigger and bigger. That means we have to understand the termination mechanism. So polymers have a termination step. A, something happens in the reaction that stops the polymerization. 2DPA1, we know happens, the reaction goes for a long time, but then it stops. The stopping determines how big your molecule plate is. So we'd like to understand that stopping mechanism. The field of polymer science has done amazing things playing with that stopping mechanism. You can, if you can control that stopping, you can make lots of polymer all the same length. That turns out to be really important. You can make really long polymers. You can make short polymers at will. And that's going to be a focus for us. It's of fundamental importance, but it also can make new materials with uh, extraordinary properties. And so you also mentioned that another thing you're working on in parallel is seeing if you can find cousins um, for this 2DPA1. So what is the purpose of that? Because we've heard in a, in a previous episode with Dr. Yuri Gagotsi about finding cousins in uh, the Maxine family. So I was just curious, uh, does that lead to finding other materials with similar, but um, also still like differentiated properties or what, what is the purpose of, of finding others in the family? In my case, if we're looking for, yeah, maybe cousin is not the right word, the next step in evolution, right? So maybe it's just a, a higher evolved species because what you can do is 
you can take the polymers that are all around us, maybe polyethylene or all the things that we make out of milk jug and different types of coating polyurethanes. And you can ask the question, so that 1D polymer or that cross-link network, can it exist as a two-dimensional polymer? And you, we already know if it can, it'll, it'll have very different and really superior properties. If your polymer is used as a coating, you're absolutely going to want it to be in this 2D form. It's, it's going to be much, much better. You almost always want a polymer to be strong in impact or have you know, what's called bending rigidity. So uh, a two-dimensional polymer in, you know, aligned in plane is always going to be better. It turns out we, we think of polymers as not really conducting heat very well. It's, polymers tend to be insulators. But actually, that's not true. If you can align the molecules in a polymer to all face one direction, you can actually make them conduct heat like metals. Actually, my, my colleague at MIT, my colleague Gang Chen showed this in a paper probably about 10 years ago. He took polymer fibers and he aligned them all in one direction. And if you measure the heat conduction in that direction, they conduct similar to a metal, right? So, um, so there are big advantages to aligning molecules and have them all face in one direction. We're going to get combinations of properties we don't expect from polymers. You're conducting heat and other things through the layers. In a lot of materials, like for the mexines and for zeolite, the material discovery itself is interesting. Every new version of the material has just a new combination of properties. Some are good, some are bad, but I mean, it is a, it's a scientific discovery process. For the polymerization, I think there's a case to be made we want a two-dimensional version of every polymer we could find. So, so it would be very interesting, very beneficial. Yeah. So you primarily talked about using this as membranes, but now that you talk about some other properties like thermal conductance and other things that could potentially be um, sufficient to other properties, uh, I know graphene is used a lot as a filler in other materials to give it strength, to give it thermal conductance, to give it electrical conductance. Would you ever see this 2D polymerization as a potential another application to be used as a filler if you are able to get these properties from orienting the uh, molecules in this direction? It could be, yes. That filler, yeah, in the material science space, they call them inclusions. The idea, it comes from the 1950s, a researcher called Shelby. Shelby was a theorist, and he showed that if you have a soft material, like um, think of a soft uh, polymer, like a milk jug polymer, you could sprinkle in a little bit of a very hard material. Imagine like little diamond particles or graphene particles. And even if the material is mostly the soft polymer, it'll harden. So, and that, that's been the dream of what's called a nanocomposite for a long time. Yeah, and that's what you describe. I've got a soft polymer, but of course I can't make an airplane wing out of that. But if I sprinkle, if I sprinkle some nanomaterial in, I can harden it enough and make really strong, but lightweight. So you get the best of both worlds. You get a strong material, but it's also very lightweight. Composites have really revolutionized our world. Jet airliners are now made of composite materials, carbon composites. They have a big advantages. They, um, the parts last longer, they're lighter, and, they have the, and they're stronger. 2DPA1, right now, I'm studying the material it's, it, itself. It's, it's strong enough and light enough just as a neat material, just as a material in and of itself. But there is a whole field, for example, of uh, Kevlar composites. I'm not an expert there. I happened to talk to one recently, and um, for 20 years or, or, or more, they've been incorporating Kevlar into composites, making very interesting combinations of properties. So they may have more to say on what 2DPA1 can do in that space. But you're right, it, it is like 2DPA1 is a very strong nanomaterial. It, that could be a way of, you could strengthen other materials. You could strengthen them by just sprinkling it into the matrix. That's awesome. I'm excited to see what's in store for, for your lab and, and this material. Um, and so we kind of just want to wrap up this episode. You know, we talked about this impressive material development and its immense potential. Um, so we just want to hear your maybe final piece of advice for students and early career professionals who want to push the boundaries of materials research and potentially achieve what many others uh, couldn't or deemed impossible. Maybe a good piece of advice, some advice I got, I was an intern at Brookhaven National Lab and a, a low energy physicist there told me some good career advice is to look at the boundaries between scientific disciplines. I'm sure your listeners have heard that, but it is true. Like look at the boundaries of so nanotechnology and biology, you know, at that boundary, lots of discoveries there and so on and so forth. So 
In this case, it's not lost on me that 2DPA1 is a polymer chemistry problem, but that can't be solved by organic chemistry. And it's really, we need a nanotechnology to come in and help it. So that mechanism I described is a nanotechnology mechanism. So the interface of nanotechnology and polymer science made that discovery happen. So my advice to your, your budding scientist, pursue an area, keep your eye out for these other areas, learn about these other areas, park yourself right at the interface between two fields and, and there's gold to discover. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. I had personally not heard about that advice, but it makes sense. Yeah, so um, I love that. And again, thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today. It was really insightful. I learned a lot. Thank you, Panith, and thank you, David. Thank you. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role in company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who've been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.